Hello, and a warm welcome to our YouTube channel, Audiobook 101. This summary is brought to you by Audiobook 101, where we provide you with insightful and engaging book summaries. Whether you're looking to learn something new or simply enjoy a great book, we've got you covered. Today's captivating summary is of The Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness by Morgan Housel. This book offers timeless lessons on the psychology of money and much more. By the end of this summary, you'll feel enriched with valuable insights. Morgan Housel, an investor and author, is also a partner at The Collaborative Fund, an investment fund focused on supporting creative entrepreneurs. He has written numerous articles for the Wall Street Journal and authored three books. So let's dive into the profound lessons from his book, The Psychology of Money. Would you choose a magnificent mansion or $3 billion? Freedom or a stellar reputation? Do you feel like you've earned enough money in life? Are you curious about how someone can earn $84.5 billion? If these questions whirl through your mind, then this book is for you. It holds the answers to all your queries about wealth, illustrating not just how to accumulate it, but also how to understand the profound effects money has on our lives. The Greatest Show on Earth When author Morgan Housel was in college, he worked as a valet to earn money at a luxurious and expensive hotel in Los Angeles. There, he frequently encountered a guest who was a young, sharp-minded technology executive. By the age of 20, this guest had already patented a crucial component for Wi-Fi routers. This young millionaire started several tech companies and sold them off, making a fortune. Despite his financial success, he was somewhat unlucky with money management. He was known for carrying bundles of cash and showing it off to anyone he spoke with. Often inebriated, he would boast grandly about his wealth. One day, he asked a parking attendant to exchange some notes for gold coins at a nearby shop. The attendant returned with several $1,000 gold coins. What did the young technician do with them? He threw the coins into the ocean as if they were stones in a pond, inviting his friends to join in the frivolous activity. Days later, after accidentally breaking a lamp in the hotel, which was priced at $500 by the manager, the young man caused a scene. He threw $5,000 in cash at the manager's face, saying, Here's $5,000. Don't show me your face again. You might wonder if this story is true. Yes, it indeed is. You'll find more such stories in this book. Ultimately, this young millionaire went bankrupt having squandered his fortune in just a few years and was deserted by his friends. See, money can buy many things, but not good conduct. Let's hear another story. Ronald Reed was a janitor born and raised in a small village, the first in his family to finish high school, which he managed by hitching rides daily. Ronald led a simple life, spending 25 years repairing cars at a gas station and 20 years cleaning floors at J.C. Penney. At 38, he bought a two-bedroom house for $12,000 and lived there all his life. Ronald was married but had no children. After his wife passed away when he was 50, his favorite hobby was chopping wood. The day Ronald made the news headlines, was the day he died in 2014, at the age of 92. He had amassed $8 million, leaving $2 million to his stepchildren and donating $6 million to a local hospital and library. If you look up Ronald Reed on Wikipedia, you'll learn he was a janitor, gas station attendant, investor, philanthropist, and a millionaire. How did he achieve this? There was no trick. Ronald didn't win any lottery, nor did he inherit wealth. He had invested steadily in blue-chip stocks over the years, saving every penny and never even withdrawing the interest. 
He compounded his savings year after year until his death, accumulating $8 million. Do you know the concept of compounding? We will talk about this later. But first, let's look at another man, quite different from Ronald Reed. Richard Fascone, a former executive at Merrill Lynch, retired at 40 after a highly successful career, even making it onto a business magazine's list of the 40 under 40 most successful people. He owned an 18,000-square-foot mansion in Connecticut with two swimming pools, two elevators, seven garages, and 11 bathrooms, the maintenance of which cost him $90,000 a month, a debt that eventually overwhelmed him. But then his fortune turned, the 2008 financial crisis struck, and overnight Richard found himself bankrupt. From the stories of these two young millionaires, Ronald Reed and Richard Fuscone, we learn that financial success is not a science, but a field where even a humble individual like Ronald can thrive. Finance is a unique field where behavior matters more than knowledge, and understanding the psychology of money is crucial. Anyone from any background can grow wealth. It just requires constant vigilance and attention. Everyone can become rich, but not everyone remains humble. Never Enough John C. Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, once recounted a story that took place at a billionaire's party. In one corner sat Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller. They were discussing their host's income, a hedge fund manager whose daily earnings surpassed the annual sales of Heller's novel, Catch-22. Vonnegut remarked on this to Heller, who responded brilliantly, Yes but I have something he will never have, enough. What is your source of income? Can you say that you have enough money? Let's learn from these two stories. Rajat Gupta, who rose from the slums of Kolkata, was an orphan who became the CEO of McKinsey, one of the world's leading consulting firms, by the age of 45. After retiring from the company in 2007, he was offered significant positions at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum and served on the boards of five different companies. By 2008, Gupta's net worth had reached $100 million. However, he was never satisfied with his wealth. Already a centimillionaire, he aimed to become a billionaire and join that elite circle. He then joined the board of Goldman Sachs, pushing himself further to achieve billionaire status. During the 2008 economic crisis, Warren Buffett decided to invest $5 billion in Goldman Sachs. As a board member, Gupta knew about this investment before it became public knowledge, and the stock was likely to rise. Only 16 seconds after a board meeting call, Gupta called hedge fund manager Raj Rajaratnam, who immediately purchased 175,000 shares of Goldman. Hours later, when Buffett's investment was publicly announced, Goldman's stock soared, and Rajaratnam made a profit of $1 million in a few hours, with Gupta earning a total profit of $17 million. This is considered a classic case of insider trading. Gupta lost all his wealth and went to prison, tarnishing his reputation. Why did he need another billion when he already had $100 million? He had everything, wealth, fame, power, and freedom. Yet greed led him to lose it all because he lacked the sense of enough. We can learn three lessons from this story. Lesson 1. The hardest financial skill is to refrain from accumulating more wealth. The lure of more power, more fame, and more money fuels ambition more than satisfaction. At some point, not advancing feels like falling behind and you take greater risks to progress. Modern capitalism excels in two things, generating wealth and fostering greed, making it hard to know when to stop. Lesson 2. Social comparison is problematic. Consider a football player earning $500,000 a year. 
he might seem affluent. However, compared to Mike Trout, who has a $430 million contract over 12 years, he might appear poor. A hedge fund manager earning $36 million annually might seem less when compared to the top 10 hedge fund managers earning at least $340 million a year. And those earning $340 million might feel less compared to the top five who earn $770 million. What about comparing the top five to Warren Buffett, who was $3.5 billion richer in 2018? Or Buffett comparing himself to Jeff Bezos with a net worth of $24 billion in 2018? This wall of social comparison is infinitely high, and you can never reach the top. The only way to win is not to compete. Assume you have enough, even as others around you chase more. Lesson 3. Some things are more valuable than money, fame, and power, no matter how much you have. Rajat Gupta stated in an interview with the New York Times after his release from prison that one should not become too attached to their reputation or achievements. They ultimately do not matter. This incident destroyed his reputation, but he learned not to hold it too dearly. Gupta was trying to justify his actions and reassure himself that his reputation no longer mattered to him. However, he was mistaken. Reputation is invaluable. Freedom is invaluable. Family and friends are invaluable. Receiving and giving love is invaluable. Happiness is invaluable. But there's only one way to attain these. Recognize your limits, know when to take risks, and understand when enough truly is enough. Confounding Compounding Lessons from one field often find relevance in another. Have you ever wondered why the Ice Ages happened? This phenomenon is similar to how compounding works in investments, gradually growing your money over time. By the 19th century, scientists agreed that Earth had experienced ice ages, a fact so apparent it was often overlooked. Our planet didn't endure just one ice age. It has seen five, with dates that we can now estimate accurately. But what would it take to cover the entire world in ice, melt it, and then cover it again? This cycle has occurred five times. However, why did ice ages happen in the first place? There are several theories about the causes of ice ages. One suggests that tectonic activities in mountain ranges brought about climatic changes. Another posits that ice ages are Earth's natural states, disrupted by volcanic eruptions. These theories, however, explain only a single ice age, not all five. In the early 1900s, Serbian scientist Milutin Milankovic studied Earth's position within the solar system and concluded that the gravitational forces of the Sun and the Moon affected Earth's axis. He noted that Earth sometimes tilts more than usual, receiving more solar radiation than normal. Changes in the Earth's hemispheres led to severe cooling, covering the planet with thick ice layers. Russian meteorologist Vladimir Koppen added to this theory, suggesting that the abnormal tilt caused colder summers not warm enough to melt the accumulated ice, allowing it to persist through the winter. Year after year, layers of ice accumulated until the Earth was entirely enveloped, leading to an ice age. Similarly, the concept of compounding in finance refers to the gradual accumulation of money. Imagine you start saving 10% of your annual salary in an index fund with a 10% annual interest rate. The next year, you'll have your salary's 10% plus 10% interest on that amount. If you continue this through 2022, each year adding 10% of your salary and gaining 10% interest. And if you do not withdraw this money for the next 10 years, you could become a millionaire, just as the Ice Age built up slowly 
through accumulating ice, the power of compound interest accumulates wealth gradually. Did you know Warren Buffett started investing at the age of 10 and never withdrew the interest earned, allowing it to compound? By the age of 89, he had amassed $84.5 billion, a result of his discipline and eight decades of compounding. If you calculate, Buffett made most of his $84.5 billion after his 50th birthday. This is the marvel of compounding. Consider this equation. Adding 8 8 times results in 72. But what happens when you multiply 8 by itself 9 times? The result is 134,217,728. See the difference? When Warren was in his 20s and 30s, he didn't spend his money carelessly and continued investing into his 60s and 70s. He consistently invested for over 25 years. Several books have been written about Buffett's wealth, emphasizing that he now has $84.5 billion. He started investing at age 10 and continued until he was 89. If a book truly captured the essence of compounding, it might well be titled, Shut Up and Wait. Getting Wealthy versus Staying Wealthy There are many ways to become rich, but there is only one way to stay rich. Let's learn this through the stories of two investors. Jesse Livermore was one of the greatest stock traders of his time, born in 1877. Before the world even understood that anyone could be a trader, he had already established himself as one. By the age of 30, Jesse had earned $100 million. In 1929, the stock market crash led to the Great Depression, a time when the news was dominated by stories of Wall Street stock traders committing suicide. On October 29, 1929, Jesse's family waited for him at home. His wife and two children stood by the door, and his mother-in-law sat inside, crying. When Jesse arrived, he was in shock. But not because he was bankrupt, he told his wife everything. He had bet that the stock market would fall, and his prediction was spot on. He became a billionaire overnight. When everyone else was betting that stock prices would rise, Jesse predicted they would fall. And he won big, earning $3 billion on that day alone. However, the story of Abraham Germansky took a different turn. Abraham was a wealthy real estate developer who had become a millionaire during the 1920s. Like many others, he bet heavily that the stock market would continue to rise. A few days after the market crash, Abraham disappeared. He had taken his own life. Returning to Jesse Livermore after the crash of 1929, he became overconfident and unstoppable, continuing to place and win big bets. He thought he would always win. However, by 1933, he had lost all his money in the stock market. A few days later, Jesse, too, disappeared, having taken his own life just as Abraham had, unable to bear the reversal of fortunes. Both men had become wealthy, but neither could maintain their wealth. Making money is one thing, keeping it is another. To make money, you need to step out, take risks, and be optimistic. However, to keep money, you must be humble and remember that your wealth could vanish at any moment. Life is unpredictable. You might be on top one moment and at the bottom the next. To maintain wealth, you must learn to use money wisely, remembering that while money is earned through hard work, luck also plays a significant role. Always remember that success is not permanent. Life will also bring defeats and failures. Past successes do not guarantee a bright future. Now, let's return to Warren Buffett and see how he has maintained his wealth over 70 years. He invested his money for over a decade and let it compound. By the age of 89, he had $84.5 billion. Warren knows investing. 
He knows which companies are the best to invest in, which stocks are the cheapest, and he recognizes the most effective managers. This knowledge helped him become wealthy. But Warren maintained his wealth by not giving in to temptations. He has weathered 14 recessions without panic selling his stocks. He never gambled his reputation. He did not limit himself to one strategy, one opinion, or one passing trend. He never quit or retired. Even after turning 65, he continued compounding his investments, and this is how Warren survived and thrived. Conclusion In this journey through the psychology of money, we explored compelling narratives that illuminate the complex interplay between wealth and human behavior. You heard about the young tech genius who whimsically threw $1,000 gold coins into the sea, a vivid illustration of the fleeting nature of wealth when squandered on whims. Then there was Ronald Reed, a janitor whose humble lifestyle belied the $8 million he donated, demonstrating profound generosity and the silent accumulation of wealth through wise, long-term investments. We delved into the tale of Richard Fuscone, a Harvard MBA graduate whose fortunes crumbled in the 2008 financial crisis, reminding us of the precariousness of wealth tied to market fortunes. Rajat Gupta's story unfolded next, a saga of a man who, despite having $100 million, was ensnared by greed for a billion, showcasing the dangerous allure of never feeling enough. You also learned from Jesse Livermore and Abraham Germansky, whose fates were starkly contrasted by their financial decisions during the market crash of 1929, both stories culminating in tragedy, underscoring the severe consequences of financial overreach. Finally, the legendary Warren Buffett teaches us the epitome of financial wisdom, his disciplined approach to investing, and his understanding of the value of patience in compounding have not only preserved but also significantly augmented his wealth over decades. So whom among these figures resonates most with you, who embodies the values you aspire to uphold in your own financial journey? As we close this book, remember that true wealth is not just about accumulating riches, but also about nurturing the values that safeguard and enhance this wealth over a lifetime. It's about reputation, freedom, family, love, and happiness, treasures that money cannot buy, but can certainly help preserve. Life is a cycle of highs and lows, and understanding this can empower us to manage our fortunes with humility and foresight. Be prudent, cherish your loved ones, and remember, the greatest wealth you can achieve is a life well lived, enriched by the people who matter most. Thank you for tuning in to this summary of The Psychology of Money. We hope it has enriched your understanding of the intricate ways wealth impacts human behavior and decision making. If these insights have resonated with you, please consider liking, commenting, and sharing this summary to help others discover these valuable lessons. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Audiobook 101, for access to a wide range of book summaries that delve into personal finance, self-improvement, and much more. And don't forget to explore the other book summaries on our channel.